and welcome back to Open Your Eyes. We are now joined by students from Galen University who are part of the criminal justice program. So we have with us today Ms. Janelle Fraser, Ms. Leah Cambranes, and Mr. Bernard Pitts. So thanks for joining us this Thank morning. You. Thanks for having Hi, us. Morning. All right. And so we have from a uh, fresh intake to almost uh, about to graduate from the criminal justice yes, program, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's go back to the, in the, the reason you decided to enter this program. Um, Janelle, let's start with you. Okay. Well, my profession, my ultimate goal is to be um, a forensic psychologist. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of programs here in Belize. And Galen was so kind enough to offer me a scholarship and they had the criminal justice program. And of course I was excited to take that yeah. and start on my journey to going to my profession. Yeah. yeah. And for you, Leah? And for me, I've always had an interest in law, social work, sociology and psychology. And, f and for me, I believe that the Galen criminal justice program is a merge between all of those different aspects so it worked out perfectly for me and I can say that um, I have no regrets at yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. Well for me um, <laughs> it's near and dear because I come from a family of lawyers. Yeah. However um, this program, excellent program by Galen, is a bridge for what we need to get done in our society. Mm -hmm. It's a bridge for our criminal justice system. And it, we, need, we need to have a link between our, judici our judiciary, our executive, and of course the legislature. And a part of all of that is the human aspect. And we can mm -hmm. only get that through criminal justice. Mm -hmm. Sure. So maybe um, you could tell our viewers a little bit about um, the program and um, I guess more specifically what um, the recent activity in terms of the mock trial, what you guys um, did in terms of that. Well, I'm fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I just started. Um, next semester would be my third semester. Okay. So I haven't gotten all of the courses as yet, but mm -hmm. from what I have experienced, um, it's, ver it's been very in insightful. Um, I'm currently actually doing a GIS course, which is quite interesting. It, it shows um, Belize in a different perspective mm -hmm. on a map. But what's so interesting about it is that we are able to take any information and input that into the system and have it shown on a map. Yeah. And at first I was curious, how could this relate mm -hmm. to criminal justice? And then I realized that there are statistics in criminal justice that we need to, to really get an insight of and to input that into the system. So it really created a link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, this for me is quite new, so I'm just getting the feel of it, yeah. but I'm loving every minute of it. And yesterday was a perfect example of getting firsthand experience mm -hmm. of criminal justice, being in court and being the marshal. I've never been in such a role where I had the entire court. So yeah. for me, that was pretty different. Yeah. And for me, while well, I'm on my last leg, I only have approximately a week and a half left yeah. till I graduate. But um, I have honestly been, <coughs> have had a blast in this program. Um, I've done classes from restorative justice to ju juvenile delinquency, to gangs, guns and violence, to police administration, criminal law and proce procedures. So as you can see, there is a lot of um, knowledge and information that we learn and we also get to be on the scene as well. For example, last semester, Bernard and I participated in a class at the Belize Central Prison whereby we went every two weeks. So we got an insight of the entire Belize Central Prison and we did on like we were on the f in the field doing practice as well. So we have really, really, really benefit, benefited from the criminal yeah. justice program at Galen, and it has also been helping us in our professional development as well. Yeah. So it has really been excellent. So you work? Excellent. 
Um, oh, no, you're a full-time student right now. I'm a full-time student yeah. right now, and I'm also a work scholar, okay. which means that I work at Gale University as well. Okay. But I'm really excited to get into the field. I know you're working. Yes. And a part-time student. Um, tell me how it impacts the everyday work that you do, and even just what you hear around you in terms of the community talk. Well, to be quite honest, it's it's tough, but it's enlightening yeah. because. With this field of study now, you are open more, mm -hmm. and you realize that there are more things to be done in our criminal justice system. Mm, yeah. And given that we have had this opportunity through Galen, <laughs> we have to take advantage of it and start having these conversations, these discussions on what we need to do to strengthen our um, criminal justice system in Belize. For me, um, in particular, um, for my internship, along with generally, we have been working at the Belize Central Prison with mm. the Wagner's Youth Facility. And it's amazing how, to this current moment, these young guys have, have adapted to us. Mm. So we are like, I want to say, almost a fixture to them right now. Yeah. And if you would listen to some of their stories, you know that you know, there are things missing from their families, mm. um, school some some something in their surrounding and that is where this program can make those gaps you know closer close them and you know have have these boys in perhaps maybe a better reform I, I really love what you're saying because it, it leads me to to broaden the discussion um, when we look at the situation of crime in this country right now, everyone has an opinion, rightly so, mm -hmm. uh, because we should all be concerned of our own personal se uh, security. But there are many different methods that people are talking about as to how to address crime, from tougher policing to softer policing to death penalty to um, you know, more rigid laws, um, and then also social programs. As an outsider, it's very easy to, to say all of these things, um, but you guys have now been studying criminal justice and you're exposed to things like Wagner's, you talked about uh, the, the court system itself. What's your perspective on the issue of crime today? And, and what do you think that we're all missing in the conversation? Um, personally, <coughs> I think we've missed uh, rehabilitation, mm -hmm. we've missed reintegration, and we've missed um, crucial, crucial social programs. It doesn't matter how much policemen you put out there, it doesn't matter how stiffer the penalty is, at the end of the day we're dealing with human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we try to, and if we make that attempt to change their thinking, their way of life, their environment, it makes a greater impact on them. Mm -hmm. For example, currently um, I have introduced a program to WYF, and every single Wagner's. one of those mm -hmm. young men are interested in it. And the program is, is designed to help them develop their social and interpersonal skills. And so these are things that we want to look at to say, you know what, this is a part of our justice system that can help crime, can help curb these young men from further getting into trouble to look at you know, what are values to them, and so on. Mm -hmm. mm. And, um, and did you find um, that maybe any of your thoughts or your ideas about the system have changed, or um, mm -hmm. did, were there any surprises from before you started the program till now? Oh, well, actually, my first visit at the prison, <laughs> <laughs> I heard about that. Yes, That's I walked in and the head of the prison, Mr. Moore, was having a presentation mm -hmm. and he was talking about these amenities and I said, but why do they need to have these? They're prisoners. Mm -hmm. They don't deserve anything. And now being there, being firsthand, I understand that the punishment itself is the freedom being mm -hmm. taken away. Mm -hmm. And we must remember that some of these inmates are not lifetime prisoners. They're coming back into society. And like mm -hmm. uh, Bernard said, it's about rehabilitation. And, and they also have human rights. Yeah. And you must not take that away from them. So while, yes, they have committed a crime, it is still important to treat them as a human and show them basically a different path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
For me, the criminal justice program has really widened my perspective of our system and the different aspects of our system that really make it run, you know, and um, rehabilitation is a really important aspect that we need to start emphasizing. We need to have more advocacy. We need to concentrate on rehabilitation and realize that at the end of the day, victims have needs, offenders have needs as well and how do we communicate with every aspect of the criminal justice system for it to just work you know and for and to just to recognize the needs of of these individuals because there's a reason behind everything and i think that our galen education our criminal justice program has afforded us the opportunity to gain a wider perspective of every single aspect in the criminal justice system. Clearly, rehabilitation is an important point for all of you. But if we're mm -hmm. really to look at the situation of crime in this country, we can't even get criminals arrested. Mm -hmm. We can't get them successfully Convicted. prosecuted. Um, and then you can look at the issue of right. re rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Let look, let's look at some of these gaps that do exist from even preventing children from getting involved in crime, which is mm -hmm. ideally uh, where you want to, to, to put your most important interventions. What are some of the ideas that you've had in reflecting through the course and what you see in society that you think could make a difference? Whoever, mm -hmm. jump in. Well, for me, you know, I think the basic understanding we are lacking, understanding that um, it is mostly youths that are currently committing these crimes and they're currently in a, a they're still developing mm -hmm. and it really takes the entire community mm -hmm. not just the police officers or the judges mm -hmm. it takes your family members it takes schools it takes the entire society to discipline that child or that teenager to to make them into a productive member of society and so, like I said, we really are missing the basic concept of understanding and trying to figure out uh, different social aspects um, that we can use to improve their behaviors. And I think Bernard touched a bit on that um, social programs, just to stimulate the mind and get them distracted from doing things that they're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree and um, well my family always says it takes a village to raise a child and I completely believe in that statement and from what I have observed during my time at the interning at the Supreme Court, there are so many procedures that have to happen before a child actually gets to, to the Supreme Court and there are many um, gaps for instance at the with the police department with when um, reports are being made and sometimes there are mistakes that are made that is really difficult for the court to process and to deal with the case. So I think that we need to have more programs within the police department as well and give our officers who work really hard more opportunities, more educational yeah. opportunities. Yeah. They need, um, it would be nice for them to have like more vocational skill training, yeah. and for them to also learn how to interact with these victims and offenders as well. Yeah. Bernard, what, what I'd want to hear from you too is, we, we see a lot where children come in conflict with the law. And for some reason, you know, once, once a child is 16 or 17, we don't always see them as a child, mm -hmm. although they are. Um, and we have a perception as to who they are when we hear of them being involved in any type of activity from robbery to murder. When you met the children at Wagner, what changed from the general perspective of these teens who are involved in sometimes very terrible crimes when you talk to them? What changed? Well, <coughs> I have a teenage son and mm -hmm. um, I speak with him very often. Mm -hmm. And um, when these young boys open up, I realize that they just need someone to talk with, mm -hmm. someone to guide them, to tell them about life, to tell them about how they can improve themselves, what they need to do. Because majority of them are fatherless. 
or from broken homes mm -hmm. and they don't have that guide you know and so since we have become a fixture as soon as we hit that curb you're hearing them Mr. Pitts, Ms. Fraser, no, Ms. Billies and it's like <laughs> enlightenment for them they're happy to see us because we sit and we have casual conversations yeah. they are blessed with two um, I call them residents from the adult population prefix mm -hmm. and you know based on their um, rehabilitation they were placed with these young boys to you know help them realize that you know what you guys were on a wrong path and we've been there we can guide you we can talk to you and tell you what not to do and so on yeah so for me being there with them I realized you know what this is all they need mm -hmm. a figure someone people to guide them however in that process we need to realize that there's something that needs to hold over to fall over when they are released from mm -hmm. Wagner yeah mm -hmm. because that's what I was gonna ask you uh, if you, you put them back in the same environment I'll for the support will perfect, it be enough perfect example mm -hmm. when we went there the last time I was looking for my god brother because he was there Julian mm -hmm. Tun and the attorney was successful in getting him released but he did not last for I'd say a month yeah he was killed in San Pedro because he went back in the same type of environment now if we have you mean like halfway houses is that what you're talking about perhaps um, halfway houses some program that will you know continue that rehabilitation because at you in Wagner's there are rules and procedures they have to follow for tea for breakfast for um, spiritual um, rejuvenation for um, recreation all that yeah. and they follow those rules to a t mm -hmm. so i know that if they're in a control envir environment with persons who are trained to help them then they will get better you mm -hmm. see but we don't have that mm -hmm. they say oh they're at um prison they, they become a jailbird and so on that stigma starts and and soon as they're out that's it and we are not so much of a forgiving society because yeah, the minute you touch Colby, that's it for you. You're tainted. Unfortunate. You're tainted. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it goes even further for those who um, may have been successfully rehabilitated. There's a requirement on almost every single job application. That's right. Form, yeah. A police record. Mm -hmm. I think it's unfair, you see? Mm -hmm. And it lends to the cycle. So if you have these youths that are going through it, imagine when mm -hmm. they become adults. Yeah. From my experience at the Belize Central Prison and in particular with the youths at the prison as well, I have learned that a lot of them or most of them just did not have opportunities, you know, given to them at a very young age. And I actually met a prisoner who really changed my perspective of, um, of offenders who told me that he discovered his passions passion for computers at the Belize Central Prison because he was afforded the opportunity to learn about computers there and he's actually the person that we met with him remember yes. he takes care of the entire computer lab at the prison and he says that the first time that he saw a computer box he didn't even know what it was mm -hmm. so he discovered his passion for computers at the Belize Central Prison but just mm -hmm. imagine if he had discovered that passion or before prior to being there or if he had even been given the opportunity to pursue his education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I hear from you all quite a bit of empathy for uh, the, uh, I'd like to say that um, the opportunities that were missed from people who've mm -hmm. now come in con contact with the law. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to go back to your mock trial because I don't want to miss out on hearing <laughs> about that experience. Um, we don't get to show the court process here in Belize. We just get, you know, mm -hmm. court reports and kind of just a little bit of what happens. So you guys actually pretended to have a trial in the Belmopan Supreme Court. You had to prepare, mm -hmm. uh, put forward your evidence, have a victim, and you had a, an esteemed Witnesses. jury yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about that process. What, what were your roles? Yeah. Well, earlier I mentioned that I was a marshal, yeah. mm -hmm. and so besides the judges yeah. i am the next person in charge of the entire court um looking at the the information given to us about the case 
Um, I said, oh, wow, prosecution has such an easy case. This <laughs> is for sure a win. Um, <laughs> but then actually being in court and realizing it's not about opinion, but based on facts yeah. and evidence, you then realize that the defense really did a really good job um, and so <laughs> and so when we hear on the news about someone getting off and we get so angry we really like you said we really don't get to see what's happening inside the court yeah. and realizing the minute that the the judge or jury um, has any bit of doubt we cannot persecute someone because the law says that you are mm -hmm. innocent until proven mm -hmm. guilty. And so it really is a tough, tough thing to prove someone's guilt yeah. in court without evidence and facts. Yeah. Well, Bernard and I were actually the defense um, mm. counsel on this entire case. And we worked very hard and we had a very fruitful mock trial. And I can say that. Um, as being defense, we really had to poke holes in the prosecution's um, story. And um, from my experience at the court, trials are very unpredictable. You never know how your witness is going to act that day on the stand or what they're going to say. It doesn't matter how much you recite. If the defense really puts you under pressure, you are going to crap. And I think we experienced that first time <laughs> because Bernard and I... Proud smile. <laughs> I am very, I'm very proud of Bernard. He and I made an excellent team from my opinion. What do you think about that, Bernard? <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. <laughs> Actually, we, we two of the witnesses we had to cross-examine, um, literally they literally felt yes, real. real. They, 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 f they literally changed. Mm -hmm. You could see that their faces, for example, um, the victim, he was literally upset. Actually... <laughs> After we finished cross-examining him, he went into the back room and he didn't want to speak to us even yes. as, you know, as friends. <laughs> and, you know, it was enlightening because many a times you have credible mm -hmm. witnesses. Yes. But because the defense position is to create doubt, that is where, you know, the prosecution has all the burden to bear. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's our job. That's what we have to do. And yeah. so if we can create doubt, then our client will simply be free. Right. However, um, we learned that here in Belize, particularly, the case was about trafficking in persons. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's a real... That's a hard one to prove. Yep. Yeah, yes. it's a real Fair situation enough. here in Belize. And I don't think we're paying much attention to it. Mm -hmm. And so for us, for me, this mock trial brought out a lot of attention we need to give for trafficking persons. I mean, you see it in many shops, many merchant shops around here. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing that it's just left mm -hmm. to and be okay. Bars. It's just okay. Yeah. So under the room. Yeah. You look at the many different bars yep. that are open. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the patrons, you know what they're there for. Mm -hmm. They're fun and what have you. But look at the persons who are serving them. It can't be that they're just getting um, free passes or just in getting work permits. I mean, you'd give work permits mm -hmm. for such, you know, work mm -hmm. activity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that is part of what came out from this mock trial. And so. that brings up an interesting point because um, is it that you now, uh, or should I say that focus needs to be had then on a whole different variety of crimes because normally when we have the conversation about crime in Belize, we always talk about gangs mm -hmm. or yeah. talk about you know, yeah. things like that, but we do have human trafficking. We have uh, so, um, all different types of things. So is it that um, you found that there's you know, maybe a, a whole different lot of parts of the system that need addressing and fixing? Exactly. Belize is on what? A tier, I think. Two. Tier. Yeah. Two? Tier. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's which That's is an improvement, it's but an improvement, still. But we, we, we need to do more. Right. Mm -hmm. Every single district you will find mm -hmm. it. Every single district mm -hmm. concentrated in Belize. And it's, it's awful. Um, and I'm speaking directly about the, the bars. Yeah. I mean, we need to crack down on those. I mean, mm -hmm. it lends to trafficking 
prostitution, mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. You have spill-offs that turns into murder, all sorts of things. And, you know, it's, it seems like it's almost just a part of everyday life. And people aren't just being trafficked into the country. We have Belizeans being trafficked out as well. Right. Which we, we, we have a hard time accepting, but it right. is a reality. And real human beings are being exploited Ex every single day. And yeah. that's why we need to create more awareness of this topic because it's not something that we usually discuss. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring up these types of topics. And people, Belizean people need to be aware of these different types of crimes that we mm -hmm. do have in Belize. And... Um, it was very helpful to us because we actually received a training before our mock, mock trial on trafficking in persons that was conducted by Ms. Charisse Francis. And that opened up a whole different scope of information that, mm -hmm. you know, um, we were taught on how to identify some of these things in our, in our society when it comes to trafficking in person. So we need to know the signs. Yeah. We need to know how to identify when a person is being exploited. And we need to report these things and really, really like put down our feet. Yeah, yeah. It's considered modern day slavery. And I think when you hear stories, it, it really will um, help you to understand why mm -hmm. it's such a severe uh, or traumatizing mm -hmm. experience for people who are involved. Um, and I appreciate you bringing it up here. Leah, I want to go back to something that you said in terms of recognizing that investigation is important. You guys are so proud yes. of being able to cast out or poke mm -hmm. holes in mm -hmm. your defense case, which Janelle said when she first read it seemed like a slam shut case. And this is so um, realistic in terms of what we know of other cases in Belize. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what your thoughts are in, in how we can improve uh, what we see in our justice system in Belize. Any one of you. I think it starts from the actual scene. Mm -hmm. I, I've had first hand, luckily, to, to work with the scenes of crime, and I don't think people understand the importance of the crime scene. Mm -hmm. This is where the evidence is mm -hmm. at, the facts. And we cannot have that contaminated for no reason at all. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you are part of the law, there are procedures and protocols. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I said, we need to start with the scenes of crime. Yeah. And then moving on with the investigation, the defense um, yesterday did something amazing to me where the, the police officer was asked questions about the investigation and simple things as finding out family members. She was not able to provide that information and it just shows um, that we're not taking investigation as seriously mm -hmm. as it should be. Yeah. And, and information that we may take for granted might be the same information that will be needed in court to prove that the person is indeed guilty. Yeah. And um, I just want to tell the public that um, it's also important for us not to judge people who are in, in, in the law. Mm -hmm. We are all trying to create this peaceful environment mm -hmm. and it really isn't as easy as we would like it to be. Um, I mentioned that we all have human rights and because of those rights, when you are in court, you cannot just penalize somebody because you feel that they did something wrong. Mm -hmm. It really is a process and we must, we must try to be helpful instead of bashing on the law itself. And evidence is also a very important part of why our conviction rate in Belize is so low because the evidence sometimes you can present a beautiful case as a prosecution to the to the jury and to the judge but if the evidence is not there then how will they prove that or how will you prove that the individual is guilty so a lot of these cases that go to trial are not I would say are not successful because the evidence is just not there and it starts from the beginning of the the entire process when like Janelle said when from the scene of, from the, crime. The, scene of the crime yeah. and it's just a chain of different things that really um, need to be worked on in order for yeah. the entire system to to be effective well for this um, for that particular um, case I thought that um, 
if it was in real life, then I would look at training for the mm -hmm. police. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, real training. I mean, you really have to come out your box. You have to understand what you're looking for. You have to understand how you will get it. You have to understand how you will deliver it. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, in trafficking persons, you need to find out where they're coming from, how they get there. Mm -hmm especially if they came through your borders. Mm -hmm. There's an element you need to put yourself in. That's the immigration. Mm -hmm. Who was that officer on the day? How was this person allowed to pass? Why was he giving us stamp? All that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all those information, when you put it together, you get a clearer picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier then when the police puts together that case and send it to the DPP or to the prosecution. They will know that, you know what, they have enough information or all relevant information to proceed with. Most of the times we hear the police in the interviews mm -hmm. and we will forward the case to the DPP for recommendation. Mm -hmm. But the DPP has the toughest job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? But the toughest job needs support and the support comes from the officers and all those involved mm -hmm. who will provide that information yeah. and they need that training to sift out that information mm -hmm. and that is what is lacking in our system mm -hmm. here so it can't be that you know the, yes the police may have the right person mm -hmm. based on maybe but they can't prove they it can't, yeah. but they can't why they need more training to mm -hmm. sift out information yeah. yeah you know and a part of that you have to put in some protection for those who may want to bring information yeah. 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 and all that. So mm -hmm. it's many things we'd have to put together. And it's interesting that you were um, talking about support um, for the whole system. Um, since you started the program, um, have you maybe through conversations with people or even maybe with some of the individuals that you all have worked with, maybe at Wagner's or at the prison, have you encountered a lot of maybe distrust or resistance towards the system? Actually, the only thing I've noticed so far is that, you know, people don't like rules. <laughs> <laughs> and so when your freedom is taken, mm -hmm. you do have a bit of resistance yeah. until you start to conform with it and understand why you mm -hmm. don't have those freedom. And so, you know, like for example, some of the youths, they were complaining that, you know, um, Mr. P, I, I don't like my haircut, man. You just look off, <laughs> man. See, if you could talk to me, I could get this and leave my copper. So, you know, I sympathize with the position simply because they are young men, they are young mm -hmm. boys. And if you treat them like adults, and you know, all right, you have this jail look, this person, and then guess what? That is what will continue to work with them. So, I, I spoke with Mr. Dawson, excellent director there. I, I love yes. working with Mr. Dawson. He's amazing. He's great. And um, he said, you know what, Mr. P, we, we will consider it. and. When the time comes, um, we'll do it in groups or what have you. And they were amazed when they started to get their lead marks. Yeah. And, oh, I'm going to go oh, today, yeah. and you know, maybe I might say I'll leave somewhere else. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going too far, but guess what? It's a part of what yeah. we have to do. Yeah. And so if you make them feel at home, mm -hmm. make them feel at ease, yes, you're within the confines of the rules, but guess what? We will afford you certain things too you know, work with and let you feel up. Well, we thank you for coming in and sharing your perspectives. I think uh, we are very hopeful uh, that persons like yourselves who are getting trained in criminal justice will definitely be an important addition to the system that we currently have in place. So best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about Kopali Rum. So stay tuned.